Long Box Magazine. Line breaking, tap tearing up Moss back. Hey, Mr. Palm Boss, tell me what to do to make all my luck or late dreams come true. I love that, making your luck or late dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust, the Palm Boss, coming at you live from the uh, hillside right here outside of Lake Texoma, west of Gordonville, Texas, north of Whitesboro, right along. The right, correct side of uh, the Red River. Greetings. Glad you could join me today. You, hey, you guys know the drill. I'm sitting here to see if I can find this show. Oh, there it is right there. I'm getting a little faster than normal. And here we go. Here we go. I was uh, got to, an email today from one of my clients, and he wanted me to study a map and talk about building some coves in a lake that he wants to build where the lake if it was anybody else, I'd tell him not to build it. But he can't. <laughs> He's got the ability. So as I thought about it, I thought, well, heck, we'll talk about using what nature offers. Because with this client, he wants nature to work with him rather than him work with nature. He's got the means to do it. So I got this map from him today. And the question was, where should we build some coves in that footprint? Basically, the footprint's going to cover up two small ponds to build about a 20-acre lake that's on about a 60-acre watershed. So when you're in this part of the planet, 60-acre watershed is not quite big enough to support a 20-acre lake. So we got a number of things to, to uh, figure out. So I wanted to kind of, as I thought about the topic today, I thought, you know, why don't we talk about something I've never discussed at all is using what nature offers you. Now, you guys know the drill. You guys know the drill. Here we go. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comment section. Click like and share this video to your timeline. And you're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat. There's one right there. Living color. Pretty cool. I don't wear hats very often, but if I did, this would be it. Matter of fact, I've worn this one a few times. I can see the scars on it. And a Palm Boss mug. Say it with me, Wayne Lancaster. I know you're there. I saw your name pop up. It knows how to. It's what's really funny. He's saying it out loud. How to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. Now, we don't know how it knows, but it does. So, just do those things and you're eligible for a drawing. We do have a winner this week. Mark Gazda from Marshville, North Carolina. He's actually a brand new subscriber, we found out. So, we've got his address. So, uh, Mark you shared this video to your timeline. Believe me, that's the most important thing because we want to build an audience. So uh, you're going to be getting you a Pond Boss mug that knows how to, Sean Peters say it, how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold, and a Pond Boss hat. Let's talk about what nature has to offer. Let me see who all is here. See, John Funk from mid-Michigan. Yep, winter's been kind of playing with you a little bit, hasn't it? Ty Rob, Kenny Sanderson checking in from Kansas. Good to see Kenny. Hey, Kenny, we need to talk about those tanks. We need you to, uh, Kenny's going to get a couple of tanks from me, I think. And we need to discuss that here in a few days. Swing a range for that. Billy Bates sent me an email earlier. And, uh, you know, when I saw that email, I thought, that's got to be Billy Bates. But I used your real name. Let's see here. Sean Peters already said howdy to him. David Hoskins vetoes checking in from Whitesboro, Texas. David Hoskins from Kentucky. All right, John Funk might get go ice fishing after all. Mike McPherson from Indiana. Mike Cottrell, Fort Worth. Palapena County, Clark Cole Weatherford. Clark, you're not going to believe this. You're, Clark Cole will not believe this. Well, he might. Uh, just I'm going to let the world know right here, we have a contract on our place. Lusk Lodge, comma two, has a contract on it, and we love the people that are buying it. We're For now, we're going to presume it's going to go through. Some things could go wrong. You know, we've passed the inspection part, and... And the appraisal's up in the air. It's being handled now, and the surveyors are coming out. So we're getting closer to closing. And we think we're going to close on or about February 23. At that point, I'm homeless. But Clark Cole, guess where we're sniffing around? Granbury. And you know my backstory. I got a pretty cool backstory in Granbury. So uh, I know you're in Weatherford now instead of Glen Rose, but we really do need to connect the dots one of these days. Tony Sutton's checking in. Tony, um, Tony, you know what? I went back and, and snagged one of your questions off of one of these uh, broadcasts, and it's going to be in the next issue of Palm Boss Magazine. So 
For those of you guys that don't subscribe to the magazine, go ahead and do it. Let's go. Wrap it up. 35 bucks. Cheaper than a Friday night date. You get a nugget from everyone. I promise you, every issue of Palm Boss, you're going to go through it, read all the articles. You're going to be entertained, informed, and there's actually going to be something in every one of these issues that you can use managing your land or your pond or your lake. I promise. There's Harrison Davis checking in from Georgia. Georgia, sweet Georgia. Kim Moore, Central Illinois. Danny Mack, San Antonio. I look well informed. Do I look well informed or well informed? <laughs> or well deformed? I'll take that. I'll take it. John Henry checking in. Good to see you. Vito, wish my Friday night date would read the magazine to me. Well, you know what? I don't know what you're doing Friday night, but we can go have supper and I'll read it to you. No way. You got a, you got a, you got a better date. You're married to your high school sweetheart. I know you. Just Chance Birch. Hey, Chance. Good to see you. How did you do with your virus shots, John Funk? You know what? I had the first one, I don't know, last week and had absolutely no effect. But it's the Pfizer shot. And I understand that the second time you get it, that your body has begun to build some antibodies and you're about 10% there. And when you get that second shot, your body really ramps up to build the antibodies. And for a couple days, you'll be kind of gloomy and under the weather, which is better than having COVID. So I told Debbie a while ago, I said, you know what? We're going to get our second shot on the 18th, whatever day of the week that is. And we ought to uh, just plan to, uh, uh, <laughs> oh, Josie just texted me. We're in the same state. Yeah, Josie's hanging out with Wayne, husband and wife, on their Wednesday night date. Yeah. I guarantee you, Josie's not reading that to Wayne. He knows how to read. The uh, uh, Anyway, uh, we're going to have it on the 18th. I told Debbie, you know, we really need to kind of shut down for the 19th and the 20th and plan nothing. So we might just hole up in the movie room and do a, we have a little media room with a with a big, not a big screen TV, but one of those things like in a theater, except it doesn't cost nearly as much, that, you know, broadcast it up on a big screen. So we'll probably do movies. We'll probably have a movie, a couple days of movie, which I never do that. All right. Kenny will talk. Chris Chavett is checking in from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh-oh. Fishing like a cat. There's no Katie Baca. Fishing like a cat. There you go. Fred Bingaman. Good to see Fred. He's got Pond Moss magazine, but that's okay. We know what he means. David Hoskins. David's wife in Kentucky. <laughs> hey, David's wife. I'm glad you're checking up on that guy. You never know where he's going to be on a Wednesday except watching this show, which is <laughs> pretty funny, isn't it? Bill Russell checking in from South Alabama. Tom Davis, Ohio. Kendall Brown, Caldwell, Texas. I'll be down close to Caldwell before long. I'm going to go uh, spend a few days in an RV at my son's place and, and the daughter-in-law and grandkids in uh, outside between Brenham and Navasota, so that's not too far. There's Daniel Hendrick. Hadn't seen... seen uh, Daniel, in a while, Mark Hicks, North Kagalaki. I've wrapped there, one of the Carolina guys. Yep, yep, Clark, a lot of beautiful spots around Granbury, but there's no inventory for sale. So, you know, I never, ever thought I would look forward to being homeless. And I've had several times when a wife would say, you know, I wish you were homeless. And there's been times I wished I was homeless. In a good way, not a bad way, in a good way. So we're kind of looking forward to... Uh, to hunkering down and seeing what the next adventure is. Debbie and I, we're never on the same page, ever. She wants to keep the pool table, pay somebody to move it twice, first time put it in storage, second time put it in wherever we're going to be living. I want to sell it. You know, take the money, don't pay for storage, don't pay to have it moved, go buy a new pool table that matches the space. But no. So we've kind of kidded each other because we're very rarely on the same page. And uh, she was teasing me. She says, you know, you ought to write a book about us. I said, you know, I got the title. We're never on the same page, but together we've written a pretty cool book. And now we're getting ready to write a new chapter. And I'm kind of excited about that. I've already spent nine minutes just bullshitting here. So we're going to oh, hope YouTube doesn't catch me on that. Whoops. Um... Let's see here, Richard Barrett, come out to Weatherford. And we're like, hey, heck yeah. I mean, if you, hey, if you and Clark don't know each other, y'all are back to back right here on your comments. Clark lives there. Mike McPherson, a magazine. Oh, I love that. A subscription to Pawn Boss Magazine is a great Valentine's Day gift. Vito, buy your bride a subscription to Pawn Boss Magazine. And then you read it to her on Friday night dates. 
while y'all are doing something. Look at there, Travis Paul Smith is checking in from Mexico. He's kind of got that thing figured out down there. Fred Bingaman got his going to get your second Pfizer shot on the 22nd. We get our second one on the 18th. We'll ring you and let you know what that's what it's like. Or we may text you or something. There's Ron Ardwan, South Louisiana. Jeff Wallen, what's the advantage of Tatapila's trees for pond? Hello, boss, Central Illinois. I have no idea what a Tatapila's tree is. No idea. You're going to have a first single degree. Projection screen, Billy Bates said. Yeah, that's right. Projector. That's it. We have a projector. That's what it is. Holy cow. So uh, I don't know what a Tatapila's tree is or Tatapilus or... I don't know. That sounds like something that you'd see in South Florida or somewhere. I don't know what the advantage is for a pond. Tell me what a Tatapilus tree is and I'll throw out some kind of opinion. I might be right or wrong. Yep. Pool table hits the road, Kenny Sanderson says. All right, Travis got to watch Thursday. Three weeks in a row at Home Depot. Two weeks, birthday party last week. Remodeling a house sucks. Hey, you know what? At least you won't be, I won't be butting in on you. Here we go, Danny Mac, where's my Woodford? You got me thinking of chapters. <laughs> yep. Uh-oh, same reason. Oh, we got a conversation going on. So you know what? Uh-oh, looks like the video got interrupted. Maybe it didn't. I don't know. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what nature has to offer you. You know, and, and looking at this map, what he wants to do, there's another map here. Oh, here it is. He wants to take this footprint right here. I think you can see that. He wants to take that footprint and he wants to add a bunch of coves, which I am not opposed to coves. I love coves. Coves increases the shoreline. The more shoreline you've got, the more fish you can attract, the better you can fish from the shore. You know, so, yeah, I'm looking at this on the delay, and I can see the footprints. Yep. And so, uh, uh, anyway, he's not taking advantage of what the contours offer. So he asked my opinion of it. So I went on Google Earth and got to looking, and I saw where the elevations change. And some of that area where he wants to have a cove, he's going to end up having a sheer drop about eight feet from the natural ground level down to the water line with trees up here. Well, he's probably going to like that cliff look. But if he'll just go out another 60 feet and go around where the natural contour is, he'll be able to save the woods. The trees will come right down to the edge of the water, and he'll have a two-foot drop to the water line. And if he wants to riprap that or put a, a, a retaining wall or something like that, that would, that would be pretty cool if he wanted to do it that way. So we're going to have that discussion. So I wanted to talk to you guys. The first... The first time I really started kind of digging into using what nature offers is when I first met Mike Otto. And I met Mike back in the 90s. Actually, it was, no, it was before that. It's probably 89 or 90. He was building a lake not far from here. And I'd met several bulldozer guys. And, you know, I kind of gotten into pond management thing as deep as, I, as you could back then because there wasn't really an industry. And uh, Mike was building a lake for an insurance man out of Plano, Texas. Well, the guy wanted to leave a bunch of trees standing up. And Mike, uh, the landowner called me and wanted me to come offer some opinions because Mike wanted to push the trees down and burn the, burn the brush piles. So I went out there and he was the very first bulldozer guy that I'd ever seen that pushes a full blade of dirt. I mean, back and forth, back and forth. That guy, he was going in the highest gear he could go as fast as he could, moving as much dirt as he could. The other guys I'd seen would be going at about half that pace, moving half that dirt for the same hourly rate. So that's when I got to see a contrast. It's like when I was raising my kids. You know, you really don't appreciate electricity until you don't have it. Yeah, there were a couple of days we didn't have electricity, and they appreciated electricity. Well, I didn't realize not to appreciate these guys over here that were pushing dirt slowly and just a little bit until I met Mike Otto. And the second thing about Mike was he was asking me questions where all these other guys were telling me what to do, were telling me how they were going to do it and how it needed to be done. So the question on the table was, I'd like to leave some, the landowner wanted to leave some trees standing and Mike wanted to take them out. So I'll always remember, I said, well, here's my first comment. I've never seen a bass live in the top of a tree 20 feet out of the water. And I promise you when those trees die and your wife sees them, 
and you got a bunch of standing dead trees in your lake that you can't get under without a limb falling in the boat, she's probably not going to want you to keep them. So he thought about it a little bit, and he decided to take out about half the trees, which was still twice too many, <laughs> and Otto pushed them over, piled them up, and burned them. But about two years later, three years later, after the trees had died, he called me out there one day and wanted Mike to come do some erosion repairs, and I met Mike out there. And he had a had a 16-foot trailer, I always remember, had a 16-foot trailer backed up to the edge of his lake, in the lake. And he was out in a John boat with a, a young guy in his 20s, and they were cutting those trees off because his wife wanted them taken down. So he was cutting the trees off, floating them over to the trailer, doing the best he could to pile them up on the trailer because they'd been sloughing limbs and floating trees and debris in the water. Well, uh which was great, except he had a tree stump at water level. So get out in the boat, you're riding around, bumping into tree, tree trunks and stuff while you're going. You know, so he didn't really take advantage of what nature had to offer. And uh, But where it really hit home with me was in North Carolina when I got to go to start working at Richmond Mill Lake. Hey, Mark Gazda, you know what? You're the winner of the drawing today. I see you popping up here. Yep, Tom Conto from Catskill. Yeah, you got you guys had a heck of a lot of snow. I was watching that. Um, our uh, cover, Paul Tuzzolino, shot this picture in the Catskills, not too far from you, I'm pretty sure, Tom. So anyway, I've been watching his Facebook post and whether you guys are trying to dig out at two feet. Oh, catalpa tree. Okay, okay, I got it. I know what a catalpa tree is. Um, I tell you what, if the catalpa tree is going to be under the water, Leave it under the water. It's okay to use that. But if it's not going to be under the water, don't cut it down. Catalpa trees get catalpa worms, which make really, really good fish bait, especially where you are. You'll be able to get some catalpa worms off of that. All right. So, Mark, you're going to be getting a Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug coming at you. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. Danny Mac, where's my Woodford? I drank it. Or, I don't know. Actually, I think the Woodford's still in the cabinet. But I do have a little a little Cabernet uh, Sauvignon tonight, so uh got to keep that throat lubricated so it doesn't start cracking like a rusty hinge on a barn door. Y'all got that visual. So anyway, Richmond Mill Lake, one thing I learned from working on that lake, and, and I've got a lot of stories I could tell which would take up too much time, but I'm going to tell some of them anyway. When I first started working at Richmond Mill Pond, which is outside Laurenburg, Laurel Hill, North Carolina, uh, and getting to know those guys really, really well, and I love them to this day. Jim Morgan is a dear friend. He's the owner, and Dave Bueller's his right-hand man, property manager. I love those guys. Well, the water rolls across the spillway at seven to 10,000 gallons per minute, and it's black water which you guys from the Carolinas know what I'm talking about. You guys from, some of you guys from uh, Georgia and parts of Tennessee, Alabama, and East Texas and Louisiana, you guys know Blackwater. Blackwater comes through sandy soils, through pine forests, where there's no buffering capacity in the soil at all. And the tannins and tannic acid from the pine needles turn the water acidic. So that water was, uh, yeah, Kendall Brown, wondering where the cup, here it is, right here. Actually, I've got a really nice wine glass today, which I keep that in my left lower drawer with my income tax returns. I never look at the returns, but I'll pull that glass out every once in a while. The uh, uh, pH of that water is 5.3. Alkalinity is less than 10, usually hovering right around zero, and the water's flowing at a high rate. Well, normal fisheries biologists will tell you you need to figure out how to get that water fertile, which means you've got to lime it, which means that you've got to build up the alkalinity, because if you don't have good alkalinity, you can't get a plankton bloom. You can fertilize till the cows come home, and it ain't going to work. Well, when you got seven to 10,000 gallons a minute, by the way, when that lake was drained and they rebuilt the dam and got ready to refill the lake, shut the valves, I say valves as in three of them, it took two weeks without rain for that 120 plus acre lake to fill up with water. So there's a lot of water coming in that lake, coming over that lake, coming through that lake. I see Scott Hohenzee, P. 
Purina Mills, good friends. You know, Scott's in charge of a lot of the wildlife feed, but he's also an Aquamax guy. So if you guys have questions about great fish food, which I'll do a commercial here in a minute. Matter of fact, let's do it right now. <laughs> if you're going to be feeding fish, I totally believe in Aquamax products. One of the, my favorite things about Purina Mills is they they don't just go do something and then tell you what they did. They, they would call me and let me reach out to people that I know and, and pull the group and say, hey, what is it you want from a fish food? Of course, everybody wants to grow giant fish. They knew that. I knew that. You know, but they wanted different sizes of particles. They wanted, you know, a fish meal-based fish food. They want to be able to grow big bluegills, but also feed, feed train largemouth bass and hybrid stripers and minnows or whatever. You know, fish will eat fish food. Well, Purina Mills, they, they went through their due diligence and created some great fish foods just for you and me. And that's one of my favorite things about them is they've been conscientious about that. And Scott helps get those feeds out into the public domain. So I'm glad Scott's watching, checking in with us. So um, anyway, what we were going to do about, and Ty, I'll get to your question in a minute. What are my feelings about fish and lake fertilizer? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll knock on the door of that here in just a minute. Um, so as I got to thinking about, and this is going to dovetail in with Purina really nicely because at Richmond Mill Lake, we knew we couldn't lime it. We knew we couldn't fertilize it because the flow rate's too high. You know, you could we could we could go in there and lime that now that lake is shaped kind of like a lizard. Just go on Google Earth, type in Richmond Mill Lake, Laurel Hill, North Carolina, and you'll see that lake. It's shaped like a lizard. There's a long tail from the from the uh, uh, south going north, and then there's several coves that look like the legs of a lizard. And we could probably go lime those coves and have some success at it. But better yet, we thought we could spend the time and the money and the effort, or we could work with Purina to build a better feed. And this happened in 2005, 15 years ago. It's when we sat down with the nutritionist at, at Purina Mills, which is Dr. Mark Griffin back then, and said, why don't we develop a feed that's as complete as you can get it? So Dr. Griffin came to Richmond Mill three or four times, studied the water, uh, started working on tweaking the Aquamax lineup. And so we figured out nature's going to give us 5.3 pH water. We know the fish will spawn in that. At 4.9 or 5.0, they won't. But at 5.3, they will. So the limiting factor for a lake like that is food. So if we can't build the fertility level up and we can't lime it, you know, let's take lemon and make lemonade and see see what how we can work with what nature has to offer. So instead of trying to fight it by fertilizing and liming, knowing that we wouldn't be real successful, it was, hey, Purina, can you make a better fish food? And they did. And the consequences of that was we, we've grown some gigantic bluegills and some huge bass at Richmond Mill Lake over, 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 over the span of time, you know, the last 15 years. Now, they've kind of reached a, a peak you know they're they're more into having being a venue than they are a fishing destination, but their feeding is consistent. They're still cranking out some two two and a half pound bluegills and some really nice bass. They're just not as aggressive as they were. But the bottom line is, is we figured that we we could see how we could use and work with what nature has to offer. So that's the kind of things I want to talk to you about in the next thirty plus minutes. So how do you work with what nature has to offer? Well, the first thing you got to do is figure out what does nature offer. Like as I studied that map this afternoon, you know, I, I got this blueprint looking map that I cannot relate to. So I went on Google Earth to see what the world actually shows. Well, there's an area that they want to turn into a cove that's heavily wooded. Well, they're going to have to pay to get rid of the trees. It's 10 feet above the water line. So they're going to have to dig down 10 feet. Where are they going to put the dirt? You know, so nature has that curvature to offer. So I made a recommendation to them today in writing that they go from having a 20 acre lake to about a 16 and a half acre lake, which will act like a 20 plus acre lake by taking advantage of the natural contours, the way that the land lays. What are, what are some things you can do to, to take advantage of what nature has to offer? Well, and take advantage of the soil types. You know, at Richmond Mill Lake, it's all sand. 
you know, so we don't have any choice. We're, we're going to be taking advantage of what nature has to offer. So, you know, water quality, what does the water have? I'm working with a guy right now down in southwest of San Antonio, Texas, between Big Wells and Katarina, Daddy Mac, Danny Mac, and uh, he's got a really nice irrigation well that he can pump into his lake and his lake average is three feet deep. So can you imagine a three foot deep lake in South Texas in June, July, August, September, October, or even add May there. That water temperature is going to be in the 90s. He's had three fish kills in the last eight years and he can't figure it out. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. The water's too shallow. There's way too many aquatic plants. The water gets way too hot. There's no thermal refuge at all. So what we're going to do is figure out how we can take that lake. Now, he sold all the water out of it for uh, for fracking down there for oil field. So now he's got it pretty well drained down, and he's got a nice budget to move dirt. So I'm going to go down there with him here in a few days and see if we can't figure out how to sculpt the bottom of that lake, get a bunch of dirt out of it, and rearrange the rest of it to get him some depth and build some thermal refuges. Bass have got to be able to down and go down and get into cooler water. And if he's going to use well water that's got a lot of minerals in it, we also need to come up with a game plan where he can irrigate out of the lake instead of out of the well. Right now, he irrigates his food plots and some agricultural land with the, with the well. What I'm going to tell him is let's put the water in the lake and irrigate out of the lake. Here's why. This is how we're going to take advantage of what nature has to offer. He's going to be putting water on plants. But when he puts the water in the lake and just leaves it, the water is going to evaporate and the minerals are going to get left behind. And when that, when that evaporation rate in May, June, July, August, September, October, part of November is half an inch a day, you know, by the time three feet evaporates off that lake, he's quadrupled the amount of minerals. Whereas if he can pump water in from the well and then pump water out, he can take water that's got some fertility because we're going to feed the fish and fertilize the water. He can take water that's been enriched slightly and go put it on his food plots and his crops and utilize that water rather than taking it straight out of the well and he can benefit the lake and the food plots and his agricultural land as well. So how else do you take care of, of how do you take advantage of what nature has to offer. Well, you know what? Every stinking bass lake on the planet, one of the number one problems is, is fish aren't harvested properly. Nobody really wants to go catch their bass and take them out. It's just work. You know, if you've got a 30 acre lake, you're taking a thousand bass out in a year. How much fun is that? <laughs> you know, it turns into work. Nobody wants to do that. Hey, I just saw Josh Milsky checking in. Holy cow, Josh moved from uh, Nebraska to Colorado. John Wilson, good to see you, buddy. I haven't seen you in a while. Hope things are good. Let's see here. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit. Let's see here. Okay, Ty, I'm going to hit your hit your question here right now. Well, first, first I'm going to finish up this little discussion. So what I want to do is see, he's going to be irrigating anyway. So let's take advantage of what nature has to offer. Other ways you can take advantage of what nature has to offer is if you're going to be harvesting fish, congregate them. Be sure you've got some habitat that bass like or bluegill, whatever you're harvesting, so they can congregate and you can get to them easier so you can harvest more of them and be selective about it. Now, I've talked about selective harvest in the past, so I'm not going to tackle that topic tonight. But I do want you to think about the concept of, of using what nature has to offer. I mean, we do it. Shaquille O'Neal does it. Nature offered him a seven-foot body with a with a physique and a mentality to play basketball. So he's taking advantage, or he took advantage of it. You know, LeBron James, same thing. His problem is his brain goes in the wrong direction and distracts from his accomplishments. You know, but he's still using what nature has to offer. Now, you're not going to catch me ever being an athlete. Now, I tried that when I was in high school, and uh, I was the ninth man on a 12-man basketball team even as a senior. So my point is, is I think if you will, when you're working on a project or when you're looking at your pond, and if Corey Simmons is watching this tonight, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Corey is getting ready. He's, he's in the, in the past the beginning stages and the clearing stages, clearing his land to build a lake. Now that he's got the trees cleared off of it, 
He can see what nature has to offer in terms of what the shape of the lake's going to be like. So if you will think about it in those terms, and Wayne and Josie, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Think about what nature has to offer you. And if you can think about that, you can actually enhance what nature has to offer rather than fight it. A classic example of fighting what nature offers, and I, I promise you, I'll talk about your question here, Ty. Um, I had a dentist call me, oh, it's been a while, probably 10 years now, from Houston. I had a property out west of Houston near El Campo, and his problem was the water was muddy. Well, I told him I'd be down that way. I had to give a speech in Brenham, and I just drug the shocker boat down there. And this was seven years ago, so when it was 2013, because Matt Rail went with me and Debbie went with me. And we, uh, I got down there early, shocked his leg, gave the speech that night. When I shocked his leg, I was amazed at how much shallow water that he had. And we shocked up primarily gizzard shad and a handful of chunky bass and water that looked like chocolate milk. Well, come to find out, he's got so much shallow water that the gizzard shad were keeping it muddy. And it was perfect habitat for gizzard shad. So I said, okay, did it not... Did it used to be not muddy? He said, oh no, four or five years ago, it was crystal clear, but it was choked with bushy pondweed. So I said, okay, so you had perfect perfect habitat for bushy pondweed. He said, yeah, and I paid a company, a pond management company, to come out and kill the bushy pondweed, and then by the end of the year, it was muddy. I said, because you opened up that habitat to the shad. So now, what you need to do is draw the lake down, and the average depth was two and a half feet. Your average depth needs to be more like five feet, six feet at least, depending on how much rainfall you get. You know, if you're in New Mexico, average depth probably needs to be 20 feet because of the rainfall that you don't get. So anyway, he uh, he drew the lake down and he gave himself a $40,000 budget and he was able to do about a third to a half of that lake where he could excavate dirt and then rearrange some of the rest of the dirt. So he got rid of over half of his, of his uh, shallow water. He built some peninsulas and built a couple of islands, things like that. Did a good job of it. And then lake filled back up and in the shallow areas, which now was cut in about half or so, he had about 25% of it cover up with bushy pond weed. Guess what he did? He hired the same company to come and kill the bushy pond weed. Eight months later, his pond was muddy again. His lake was muddy. His lake's about 15 acres, something like that. I don't remember. But anyway, the moral of the story is, is, is if your budget's $40,000, you need to work with what nature has to offer you, which I think you could have removed less dirt, given up some surface area, and added more features to create depth. In other words, more fingers and more peninsulas. And then you could manage enough bass to keep his gizzard shad in check. You know, so here's your take-home point. Think about how you can work with nature so you're not working against nature because nature always wins every single time. So think about that. So Ty wants to know, what are my feelings about fish and lake fertilizer? I don't have any feelings about that. I have feelings for that pool table that I want to sell that my wife wants to move, but she's got bigger feelings than me. So, Here's what I think about fish and lake. When you say fish and lake fertilizer, I presume you want me to answer a question about fertilizer. So that's the direction I'm going to go. I think south of the Mason-Dixon line, especially the further south you go, you get into the south, southwest, southeast, fertilization is a key component of managing a pond. Because in those areas, phosphorus is typically a limiting factor in order to grow a good plankton bloom, which does two things. One thing a plankton bloom does is it prevents, it, it shades the water enough to prevent rooted vegetation or at least put it off or postpone noxious amounts of rooted vegetation that we see in the south, you know, southeast, southwest. So, but the biggest point about fertility is if you've got a good plankton bloom, you've got a great food chain for your fish. So brand new hatched baby fish, they've got to have food. If they don't have it, they're not going to survive very well because they don't have any fat built up in their bodies. So they got to glean their food from the water column. So I'm a big believer in fertilizer, especially in the lower part of the Midwest, all the way down to the south, and up along the Atlantic seaboard up to maybe Virginia. And when you get north of those areas, high fertility can lead to problems with water quality 
over time, which can, can actually enhance the risk of fish kills. Now, there's areas of the planet, like where John Wilson lives in, in Ohio, where they've got so much phosphorus in their water that they want to get rid of it because it creates, with the imbalance between phosphorus and nitrogen, it creates noxious amounts of blue-green algae. And in, in Chardon, Ohio, and that part of the country up there where uh, John lives, I mean, there's reports in the paper every year about somebody's dog that swam in a pond full of blue-green algae, and it killed the dog. You know, so different regions of the of the nation, they're not going to use fertilizer. You ain't going to see anybody putting fertilizer in a pond in South Dakota. John Funk ain't going to use it in mid-Michigan. But you talk to you talk to Ron Ardoin down in Lake Charles, Louisiana, he going to be using some fertilizer because he gets great benefits from it. So here we go. Um, Travis Paul Smith checking in, believer of aqua. Yep, you know what? Speaking of that, I love Texas Hunter products. One of my favorite things is they reach out to me. I'm not having to call them. You know, they, they call me and say, hey, we got this new product coming out. Or, hey, Bob, you know what? We thank you for making that sale or, or turning those guys on to Texas Hunter products. And, you know, we shipped two feeders to Georgia today, and it was all about they were, saw it on your show. You know, and so they let me know, and they're thankful for that. But my favorite thing about Texas Hunter products, if their feeders weren't any good, and they didn't work, and their customer service was meh, we wouldn't even be talking about them. But their products are outstanding. Very few times do I have any. The only problem I ever have with Texas Hunter feeders is every once in a while when you get one of these sideways rains, some water can get up under the lid. But if you'll put a little bone, a, a, a bead of silicone, a bone of silicon, a bead of silicone around the top of that thing where you can seal that lid down and keep the rain out, that's the only problem I ever have. Every once in a while, we'll have a, 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 a one of the little prongs on a battery will, will corrode off. That's no big deal. We fix that, you know. But they're highly responsive. Whenever I place an order or call them, say, "Hey, I got a I got a guy that's uh, his timer's acting up. What's his name? What's his number?" And they call him, you know, or I'll have him call them. So I love their customer service. I love their product. Same with Karina Mills. You know, and, and I appreciate their sponsorship of this show. And by the way, by the way, I spent six hours today working on content videos where I'm getting ready to launch on uh, the Palm Boss website, the, the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology content, where you can go on, log on. Now, you're going you're gonna to put a credit card in there because I ain't going to do it for free. But I tell you what, when you see this curriculum, you guys have heard me say this before. Everybody that buys recreational property, every single one of them pays a dumb tax. And Freeman Sawyer came up with that term, I'm going to steal it and use it till I die. But it's, it's, what it is, it's a matter of you don't know what you don't know. You know, and if, if there's things you don't know about your land and I can help you learn that, what's that worth? You know, and even Freeman right now is struggling with some things. He's trying to get some dirt, some muck dug out of a lake, and he's struggling to get it done because he's having a hard time finding the right contractors to do the work. You know, so everybody that has rural property, you don't know, if you don't know how to build a barn, you don't know how to build a fence, you don't know how to work with local contractors, you know, you got, there's, those are issues. Well, when you, when you dig into the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology, I'm going to help you save some money by helping you learn some of these things about owning rural recreational property. Now, I'm not ready to launch it yet. I'm still trying to get all my content in order, but I spent six hours on that today. I'm going to keep scrolling down here because I'm missing some new comments. Let's see here. Travis Paul Smith, one year I see 100% difference in my lake. Yeah, you know what? I know what you're saying because when you're when you're feeding your fish consistently, you're going to see consistent growth rates. You're going to see fish that can maximize their size potential. More of them, too. So, you know, I mean, I get... It, it's and I, and I love purists. I get questions from purists all the time. Do I have to feed my fish? No, you don't. You don't. You know, your your pond is going to grow food, you know, and you don't even have to fertilize it. You don't have to feed it. What you got to understand are the five, and you know what, you guys have been watching this show for a while. You know the five fundamentals, and I'm going to hit them right now. You got to have happy water. If you don't have good, clean, healthy water for your fish to live in, or your plants, or your crustaceans, or your insects, 
If you don't have good, happy water for them to live in, nothing else matters. If they're living in a sewer pit, none of these other things matter. But if they're living in good, clean, healthy, healthy water, then they're going to do fine. The next thing is habitat. You got to have the best habitat for the different species of fish, the different size classes of fish of those species. If you've got that habitat with happy water, your odds are going up. Then you got to have a good food chain. So if you've got a good food chain that can perpetuate itself because you have happy water and great habitat, the food chain is going to escalate and you got good genetics, then the main thing you got to do is have a harvest plant. Now, if, you're, if you don't want to feed the fish and you don't want to fertilize, don't expect to get as high production out of that pond. You know, it's like a, a cattle feedlot. Those guys are going to go pour the feed to those cows and their cows are going to grow. But if they're going to graze the cows based on the amount of rainfall and the amount of grass that they've got, then their stocking rates are going to change and their results are going to be different than somebody that feeds. That's all it is. You know, so uh, I'm a big believer in feeding because I like to do things. I mean, we live we live in a fast food society. You pull up. May I take your order, please? Yeah, I think I'll have a double whatever with three sides of this and a, and a glass of wine. Ooh, might not through the drive-thru, but maybe not. Maybe so. So a lot of folks out there really want to grow fish fast. Anyway, so I don't even know what I'm talking about. Let's see. Mark Durham, the boys are ice fishing pretty hot and heavy around here now. Sounds like this polar vortex this week will make it even better. Yep, you know what? We got a polar vortex. You know, it was 70 degrees here today. Holy cow, it was. And I wore a long sleeve shirt. What was I thinking? Ron says he's sounding like, yeah, that, that lake down in South Texas is probably pretty similar to the one you're working on with the 15 acres that you told me about. Um, spot on. Danny Mac says, spot on. There's nasty water down south. That's even, you know what? It is radioactive. Now, I haven't told that landowner this. He's in the Carrizo Aquifer. And I can remember, good gosh, this had to be 84, 85, 86 through there. On up into the early 90s. I had several lakes that I was consulting on there down in South Texas. And one of the professors from A&M decided he would check that water for radioactivity. It was, and it wasn't enough to bother anybody. I mean, it wasn't enough to, it's not as much radiation as you get from an x-ray, but still, they could detect radioactivity in that dadgum well water, which spooked me early on until I learned about it. You know, like snakes spooked me early on until I learned about them. Well, Danny Mac's right on. That water is radioactive. I wasn't going to say that, Danny Mac, but I'm glad you brought it up because it's entertaining, if nothing else. Harrison Davis, if the backside of a dam is covered in small and large trees that nature has offered, would it do me any good to remove only the four-inch diameter trees, or should I say to hell with it, leave them all? You know, um, I tell you what, Harrison, I think if trees are four inches in diameter or smaller, take them off. Cut them down. Get rid of them. I, th I think it's smart to do that. If they're bigger than that, leave them alone. Dave Weber, checking in from Kansas City, got his magazine. It is a good issue. You know, and I tell you, you got your issue today. You know when we mailed this magazine? It pisses me off. We mailed this magazine. This went out December the 23rd. 23rd. And here it is, like seven weeks later, and you get it. You know, the Postal Service has got some great big issues. We, uh, Leanne was looking for a check from one of our advertisers and was kind of hounding them a little bit because it was a pretty good check. And they said, I swear we mailed it December 16th. So they issued a new check. This was like, like two weeks ago. So they issued a new check, sent it FedEx overnight, and she got it and deposited it today. Today, we got that check that was mailed December 16th. So the Postal Service, you know, I guess all those damn mail-in ballots screwed them up pretty good, but I think that's kind of over. But this issue is, is a good issue. I'm sitting here looking at it with you just a little bit, Dave, whoever. Um, let's see here. Considerations when creating an entertaining fishery. Fast-growing fish have the best chance at trophy sizes. Um, making our pond. There's a there's a couple out in California that wanted to build a pond. This is a really good story in here. Performance culling. That's a good one. 
That's a guy from uh, Oklahoma that wrote that one. But we've got some really, really good, good stories, which each issue we do, I promise you, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date and lasts a year. That date's over about 30 minutes after you're back in the house and the rest of it's gone the next day. Okay, let me see here. I'm going to go on down here some. Okay, Robert Hudson, Pond Boss, surprisingly, my Blue Girls have eaten Aquamax MVP most days this winter so far. Not near as active as the warmer months, but I'm really surprised. Hoping you see good results coming soon. They're about two years old in middle of Georgia. Keep feeding them. Keep feeding them. If they're eating, even if it's just slowly eating, feed them. Richmond Mill Lake, Bruce Candelo has caught two bluegill over three pounds in that lake. That's 14 or 15 inches long. I mean, that's a bluegill that big and that thick. And the, a huge part of the reason that he was able to catch a fish that big is because we fed them during the winter. Now, of course, that feeding was a commitment and, and still is a commitment at Richmond Mill Kingfisher Society. But what, what we found was if we would even just keep a few feeders going at a minimal amount over the winter, that made a big difference. So if those fish will eat a little bit, feed them a little bit and keep doing that, Robert. Yeah, yeah, Vito, he was on the football team. He played ass back. Every time I stood up, the coach said, sit your ass back down. <laughs> Vito, I remember when you were in high school. That's not totally true. Cheers. <laughs> I love Vito. Jacob West checking in. John Mashburn. How do you get rid of leaf litter? I'll tell you how I do it. And Jacob, good to see you, buddy. It was good to see you earlier, you know, a few days ago. Uh, we love you, buddy. That's what I'm going to tell you. How do you rid a pond? I'll tell you how I rid a pond of leaf litter. I've got the ability to lower my ponds and then fill them back up. Now, we irrigate out of the swimming pond, which allows two other ponds to draw down some. So after the leaves fall in the fall, they typically blow against the shore, waterlog, and then they'll sink. And I can drop that water level about two feet and then get out there with rakes and rake those leaves out because they're all right there. They're all right along the shore. And when they're right along the shore, we could take one of these big, um, like a moss rake. It's uh, it's not like a leaf rake you see at the garden store. It's it's got it's wider with shorter teeth that are more narrow, and, you, and it's got a rope on it so you don't have to wade out in the mud. So you can literally throw it out there and start raking those leaves up on the shore. And I'll rake them up. I don't do it anymore because I'm too old and fat and I don't want to. I'll pay somebody to do it. So we rake them up, pile them up, let them dry out for a few days, then move them wherever we want to move them. Typically, I'll move them somewhere where I can mulch them with a zero-turn mower. So if we pile them up on top of the dam, I can run my zero-turn mower right over them four or five times. Just start going in circles, running over them. They'll mulch and go right down into the grass right there on the dam. Let's see, Ty Rob from Oil Drilling. I think you're asking me about that South Texas pond. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, th th that South Texas pond, if you're asking me that, where did the water, they, he, he sold his water to an oil field company for a frack pond for drilling. And he decided what, he, what his decision was, rather than pumping it back full with the well, he wanted to go ahead and draw it down because he's had so many fish kills in the last 10 years <coughs> that he wanted to... Uh, draw it down and just completely rehab the whole bottom of the pond. And he was referred to me by a mutual friend. Let's see, Robert Hudson hasn't gotten his magazine yet. I don't get that, man. I really don't. That's got to be... And, and Fred hadn't got his. Well, they were mailed two days before Christmas. So here we are six or seven weeks later, and you don't have it, which is just infuriating to me. Because here's the problem. We pay the post office to do it, and then when they don't, <coughs> then we send another one. We pay first class postage, and that chews up twenty five percent of our profit off of that off of that subscription. And the post office, all they do is shrug their shoulders and say, eh. "Oh, we don't know. Sorry. Come on, post office, act like a business." Let's see, Danny Mac. I'm looking at getting a rake right now. <laughs> and you know what? You know what makes me laugh about that? I know he is. I know he's watching this show on his on his computer. And he's got his damn phone in his hand looking for pond rakes. 
Mike McPherson, what about small feedings when the ice is on? I have an aerator going in about four feet, so it's open water, but not sure if it would be beneficial. I'm going to tell you, I'll give you my spin on that. <clears throat> if you can catch bluegill through the ice, they'll feed. Now, i tell you what I would do. Now, this would take a little bit of work, Mike, but if you will take that Aquamax fish food and soak it in water just a little, just for a little bit to make it mushy, and then if you'll spray it and then drain the water off of it, but it needs to be just mushy enough where you know it's going to sink slowly in the water, and then spray a fish attractant on it, then I pretty well bet you those bluegill are going to eat that fish food. Now, if you'll do that through a hole in the ice, it's almost like chumming. Now, you need to be pretty close to where they are because they're not going to be so active as they're going to go try to come find it. But if you can put it where they are and you add a little bit of like some anise oil or, or some kind of fish attractant that you can buy at, a, at one of the uh, tackle stores, then you're going to increase your odds of the fish food getting eaten. If it's a dry pellet floating on the surface, probably not going to eat it. But if you'll add enough water that it can be absorbed and lose its buoyancy, they're going to be more likely to eat it. Jeff Thompson, good to hear from Jeff. I think we're going to have a conversation here pretty quick. Putting 68-inch F1s in mid-March, how many would you expect to get eaten by five to six pound bass? Do they need fairly dense habitat to hide and eat? I'd say yes. I would say yes. They need some dense habitat to hide. Now, here's the problem when you take 68-inch F1s. The problem is going to be the first eight hours they're in the lake because they're going to be disoriented for about the first two hours. Then they're going to dart around to safety for about 30 minutes to an hour. And if you can keep them from getting eaten in that span of time to give them enough chance to go somewhere where they can hide, then your survival rates go way, way up. You know, and uh, I don't know how many five to six pound bass you've got. You know, so eight inch F1s are going to survive pretty well in a lake that's got you know, a variety of sizes, and it's not crowded with bass. Micah doesn't have his either. I'm sitting there getting mad. No, I'm not. Oh, okay, Ty says, I was meaning the radio activity is, is it from the oil wells breaking through. No, no, has nothing to do with that. It's It's got to do, the radioactivity in that aquifer has got more to do with the formations. And Danny Mack is a is kind of a nuclear physicist. He Danny's sitting here, he's, He's, he read that question. He's getting ready to chime in with an answer. But I'm going to tell you, it's got more to do with the natural formations. In South Texas, believe it or not, there's uranium mines. And, I, and those uranium mines, the most of them that they've done, and I don't know how much uranium they get, but I looked at an 80-acre lake one time shaped like an ice cream cone where the water was 135 feet deep in the bottom of the cone. And the, and the spoils of that mine... And it was round. It had a road going round and round and round all the way down to the bottom of it. 135 feet deep. 80 acre lake. And the mound of spoils that came out of that mine was 60 feet tall around part of the perimeter of that, of that hole in the ground. And when they hit groundwater at 130 something feet deep, they came out. Well, if they're mining uranium down there, you can pretty well bet there's some source of radioactivity not coming from the oil field. I don't know what the oil field does that's radioactive. I'm not smart about that. Ty says it's a, a lake rake. Love mine. and this, Yep, I love mine too till I gave it away. But I can borrow it. Ron says, if you want to invest money in something, the Institute of Higher Pondology. Here we go. Look at that. Holy cow, we got an endorsement coming in. You know, Ron came and we had a great time. And uh, now, Ron, I'll tell you, I'm really thinking about how to do another one. But in the meantime... I got to figure out since we sold our place, I got to figure out where to do it. I got it. I mean, we can go where we did the, the lake analysis. I think we can have it there, but <clears throat> I got to figure all that out. Plus with until, until the liberals get out of office with their, you know, their COVID thinking, I'm a little skittish to try to get groups of people together. Uh, as much about the virus as much, as much as the politics, but I'm going to kind of stand back and see what goes on. But in the meantime, I'm going to make this curriculum where if somebody wants to, uh, somebody wants to take advantage of it, you can at an affordable price. The will help minimize you paying the dumb tax. Danny Mac says, 
Uranium from western volcanic ash settled on South Texas plains. The water follows an underground. Look at that. I knew, I knew, I knew Danny Mac would have the answer. Holy cow. Good gosh. Man. Hey, Wes Neal. Look at that. Okay, uh, Harrison Davis highly recommends the water. That water quality book was written by Dr. Claude Boyd from Auburn University. So if you want to see about that, go to the Palm Boss website. Wes Neal is one of my favorite people. Jason Wesley Neal, fisheries professor, Mississippi State University, highly active in the fisheries business, um, way up the food chain of the American Fishery Society. He is he is a superstar in our industry, and I'm thrilled to death that uh, that he's here. And you know what? He can answer every question that's asked on this, I promise. Look at there, Justin Shank. Well, it's okay that you're late because you live in California. I want to know, did you did you sign the recall petition? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just kidding, sort of. Your pond's filled up big time. You know what? You guys were in a drought, and then you had a bunch of fires. Now you got rain and mudslides. So, Justin, I'm glad your pond filled up. Justin's out on the left coast. Got him a couple of ponds now. And uh, living a good life out there. Travis, great show, you bet. Thanks, man. Can't wait for the pay podcast. You know what? I am working on some podcasts as well. Some of them are going to be free. Some of them are going to be part of the curriculum. So in the meantime, uh, and I'm also working on a book. I've, I've uh, I finished the manuscript a couple of years ago. Now I'm picking up pictures, and I'm hoping I can get that book in print by early summer. I hope. I've got some of it going to lay out tomorrow which just it just takes time and it's really hard to kind of juggle all the time, live a balanced life and try to figure out how to move. You know, so here we go. Solar deep well pumps. Any expertise? Yeah, I've got a little bit of time. I've got a little bit of expertise with solar deep well pumps. Yeah. You know, um of course they 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 pump when the sun's shining. You're going to spend <clears throat> depending on how deep the well is, on how much energy you're going to need. But I've got one client in particular that's got a well that pumps when when the sun is on and he's got the amperage right and the voltage right. He's spitting out 200 gallons a minute out of that well that's about 300 feet deep. He's got solar panels <clears throat> that I'm going to tell you are about twice as big as a pickup truck. But he's also got them on... Oh, I don't remember what they call the gadgets, the trackers, where the solar panels will track the sun as the day goes on. You know, so for however many hours the sun's out, <coughs> and he wants that pump to go, he it goes. What's the podcast going to be? Uh, let's see here. Um, podcast. There you go, Vito. South Texas is famous for petrified palm. Apologies to Jim. You know what? I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Podcast, that boy Vito. Uh, what's the podcast podcast gonna be? Just search Palm Boss, I reckon. Yeah, I don't have it up yet, but here, <coughs> here's what I'm gonna do. There goes my voice. I'm taking the content that we've used in the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology, and I'm turning it into videos along with some uh, PDFs that are written, some audio podcasts and a handful of hands-on type videos and turning them into a curriculum <coughs> where you can go onto a website, log on, pay the money, which is however much it's going to be, I don't know. <coughs> I haven't quite got to that yet. And then you can go through that curriculum in an orderly fashion. You know, it's, I don't know what, I haven't figured it out yet, probably four or 500 bucks, something like that. It's 1500 bucks if you come and eat food and stay the night with us and hang out and all that. But, uh, anyway, I'll get that part figured out, but it takes you through a curriculum of basic pond management, etc. Now it's, I consider that premium content. It's not that I don't do premium content on these shows, you know, which I do, uh, which I'm happy to do that. <coughs> and there's some, uh, of course at pondboss.com, there's a lot of free videos, free articles, free podcasts. But these are going to be premium that are focused in on specific topics that landowners who have water can benefit from. So that's what I'm going to do there. Holy cow, 729 and the questions are coming. Here we go. Berry nets to grow out fishing coves. So what do I... Okay. Yep, yep. You know, <coughs> barrier nets to grow fish out in coves are pretty good if you don't have any fish inside the net that will eat your babies. 
So like what Eric West has done in the past in Mississippi and other guys, and I, I think West Neal's done this before, is you take some long seams and you block off an area in a cove to put small fish in to feed them up, to get them big enough to go maybe from here where they're affordable at 20 cents a piece, to get them up like that, like bluegills, for example, feed them up larger, then pull the barrier net out, and then let those fish go join the population. That's pretty kind of a common practice, but you got to be sure when you put the barrier net in there that nothing is stuck behind it, because all you need is five little bass about that big chowing down on your little bluegills, and the thing doesn't work. But it's going to be, it's, 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 Barrier nets can be effective with the right kind of cove as long as the barrier net goes all the way to the bottom and fish can't migrate back and forth. Let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and spend a few extra minutes on some of this. Regarding crappie, if a small pond has a sustaining population of yellow perch, would it still be okay to have black crappie if the perch spawn first and could help? You know what? If, if, if they can control young of the year crappie, Especially if it's if it's small waters and you want to try it, I'm all for that. I just don't know how long it'll work. It might work for three or four years and then fall flat on its face. With a small pond, so what? Start over. You know? So I, I tell you this. I tell you this, Robert. I love people trying things that nobody else thinks will work. Because if you do it and it works, I want to hear about it. Because that makes good reading in Palm Boss Magazine. You know, the the... The fisheries biology that I know has been developed through people that have done it before me and then 40 plus years of me doing it. So, you know, over that span of time in our environment, in, in our box, we develop our thoughts. And I've just not seen many situations where small ponds grow enough big crappie to make it worth it. I'm not saying you won't grow big crappie, but what I'm going to suggest is that you're going to get enough to eat 10 meals. And if that's okay with you, that's okay with me. What do you think about buying probably with an old limestone quarry now filled with spring water? Good calcium carbonate for bass growing? Yes, I would say that. Will you include stuff from your original hangout? Yes. <coughs> As a matter of fact, Danny Mac, you're in some of those videos. All right. Yep, Ty Rob says the exclusion net didn't work for him. He saw his bass jumping out of the water. Drew A checking in, running a bit late. Hey, I'm going to wrap it up. It's 7.32. <clears throat> My throat's starting to argue with me just a little bit. Now, I tell you what, I'm always fascinated at how many people actually watch this video, which is, that's entertaining to me. I hope it's entertaining for you. It's entertaining to me because I'm sitting here thinking, holy cow, who wants to watch, who wants to watch a talking head talking about fish? But you do. And I deeply appreciate that. And you know, Pond Boss, 35 bucks a year. It's well worth it. And plus, it, it's the economy that fuels our ability to do, to do this, along with a handful of sponsors. So thanks to those sponsors. Thanks to you for watching. And I will catch up with you next Wednesday night, probably from right here. Adios.